Hey guys, this will be video four for the how to design build uh, 1950s era uh, solid body arch top jazz guitar. I almost called it a flying V, <laughs> but it's not a flying V. Uh, there's really only one point list that I need to consider, but uh, it could be turned into four videos, quite frankly. And for the most part, all I'm going to be covering is uh, the brief discussion about uh, constants and variables and basically how we're about to transition into uh, making a very precise uh, drawing and template and then we're going to move to roughing out some lumber and hopefully by the time this video ends I will have this maple roughed out in this shape right here might not be that close but we'll we'll see and uh what i need to do is just stop talking so that we can achieve that with within around an hour or hopefully less so let me put my point list over there and uh a picture's worth a thousand words and if that be the case then the actual um neck itself should be worth even more is that in the camera all right so that's our target and I spec'd the neck that I'm building based on the Stuart McDonald specifications. And my neck is actually about a 16th of an inch thicker at the 11th fret and even the first fret. So my neck is even bigger than the authentic 50s uh, design. So uh, what, in other words, what you see is, is very, very, very close to what we're going to be building. And I'm going to try to keep a real nice grip on that so I can spin it very slowly so that you can really visually capture some of this authentic um, curves and contours and, and such. And then, um, is it going to be identical to this? No, actually, uh, the, the, the pitch on my neck, I'm going to get behind the camera, or at least for... My, my pitch is not quite 17 degrees, and it's like, uh, I wish I had have gone a little bit s steep. I think mine's 15 to 15 and a half to 16 per like a typical Gretsch, but it's all right. It is what it is. Uh, but taking a, just, you know, taking a nice look at what it is uh, we're about to build. The reason I'm doing this is I'm going to be talking about headstock pitch, tuner locations, the space, the center, the distance from one uh, tuner post to the next, uh, truss rod um, exit out of the fretboard, the nut, the fretboard, the beginning of the. Uh, let's see if I can find something straight. Darn it! Uh, here's a perfect. One. Bear with me. The beginning of the fretboard. Okay, the, the top of the nut, meaning the top of the nut, you, you know, I'm being kind of elementary here, but if you're, if I'm, if I'm not careful, um, I can really lose 90% of the people viewing this video series, because if you can build a neck, you can pretty much do anything. This is, to me, this is probably some of the most uh, difficult woodwork I, I had ever done. And, and there's so many variables that have to be that have to uh, be addressed. But once you get just one or two constants, like the, the width of this, uh, the nut location, the width at this uh, 12th fret, lo fret location, the width of this, this 22nd fret location, uh, once you have these constants, just three or four of them, it, it pretty much falls in place. All right, so I'm going to put that to the side now that we, we've got a good visual for, oh, I didn't mention, I'm going to be calling this like the heel, and obviously this is called the headstock. This is just the nut location, and um, so when you hear me talking about the heel, get that as far out of the way, you, you understand what I'm talking about. All right, let me check the time. We're already nearly five minutes. Okay, I need to I need to get on point here because if I'm going to do what I'm planning on doing. Okay, what did, what do we? What's our objective? Is uh, we we we, we got to design this thing 
even though we can go online and we know, okay, the headstock is 17 degrees. I, I'm just going to go robotic here, and I'm just going to knock this out. Uh, this dimension here, if you want to grab your notepad, this needs to be about one half of an inch to nine sixteenths, nine sixteenths of an inch once it's finished. Okay, I'm not going to start engineering what ifs. Uh, this area right here, not at the nut, but but roughly where the 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 widest flare of the headstock is, this area is going to be need to be right at five eighths of an inch or slightly less. Don't be don't be any thicker than that. That's too thick. Your this this first fret location is going to vary. It's just going to depend on on your own taste. And in that case, so is the eleventh fret location. Uh, for this guitar that we're building here, the distance from the beginning of the fretboard, okay, the distance again from the beginning of the fretboard to the sixteenth fret for a 24.562 inch scale, okay, is going to be 376.054 millimeter. Okay, now, so once you have that constant, man, you got a, you got a ton of information, because now you know that this, uh, well, I don't have to grab it, because you know what a nut, a, a nut is. We know that the nut, I'm going to have to get it because it helps me. It's easier for me to just show the thing. We know that the nut is 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, give or take. It's in that area. Okay, so from that distance here to the 16th fret, 376.054 millimeter. Okay, you want a four degree pitch? Okay, you want, you want a four degree pitch going into the body? Now's the time to make that mark. You want a four and a half degree? You want a, want a five degree? Don't go five, that's too hard. That's too, that's too much. Um, your target needs to be around four to four and a half degree. Okay, that's that, that's that angle right there. All right, we got that behind us. Now, um, the next thing we need to determine is how tall is the tenon? And that needs to be uh, approximately one and one half inch. I don't really have time to do the metric conversion, but I think it's 39 millimeter. Okay. Again, we're just doing the we're just doing the side profile right now. So give or take. But this heel is going to extend beyond ever so slightly. Typically about an eighth of an inch. I like mine to go a little bit further because I would rather have too much that I can come in and cut off later on. See what I'm talking about? Let me get this in the camera. This is pretty important. I'm talking about this this distance. This distance. I'm gonna put my pencil on that depth right there. That's critical from that you that you nail that on the head. Mine is a little bit further down than the true vintage 50s. I thought they I thought they stepped up a little bit too high. When I build a true jazz guitar or like my big body jazz guitars, uh, this comes down flush. And all of this, all of this material gets shaped into the body and is beautiful because there's these beautiful accent lines and all that stuff. You, I wouldn't recommend you attempting to do that type of stuff if this is your first guitar, but I'm talking about that heel height. Okay, back to, back to details. So now that you know what I'm talking about, um, you, you pick your own number. So just, you know, this is where you get to customize it. But this needs to be about one and one half inch tall. Uh, the length on this tenon from where our 24.562 inch scale starts, which is, I'm sorry, where the 24.562 inch scale meets the body at the 16th fret, Okay, it's your the tenon is going to be an additional four and five eighths inch in length max. It really doesn't need to be any longer than that. You can if you want to, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm just gonna stay on point here because if we're looking at this whole, this whole side profile, 
Once it goes up into the body, we're going to be routing out for the neck pickup location anyway. And you'll look down in the body and you'll see the top of that, you'll see the top of that tongue or tenon. You know, just imagine this is the top, but it's gonna stop before you know the pickup cavity ends. If you're if you're this far along, you've already seen these pictures online. Um that's really about it, believe it or not. <laughs> Because once you have that point right there, that you remember what I said, once you once you have that 16th fret location, man, everything else pretty much defines itself. It really lays itself out. And then you set the pitch. I'm not going to repeat that. And you set the hill depth that you want. The, the one on my guitar is massive. It's, it's just as big as the original. Is this the hill? Yeah, that's the, that's the hill on the 54 Les Paul. It's huge. It's enormous, big old fat, chunky thing. Uh, is it too much? Right at the threshold, if you ask me. Uh, well, then why did I put it on my, my guitar? Because I love the whole big, fat, chunky jazz guitar neck. Does it bother me on that guitar? Nah, not at all. Because I'm not trying to do uh, melodic, uh, what's his name? Guthrie Govan or, or Govan, the guy that's the phenomenal guitar player. You know, I don't play stuff like that. I'm doing chordal jazz work. Okay. So I got this big fat chunky jazz neck cause it's beautiful. Once you turn around, it looks like it, it looks like it came from the fifties era is what I'm saying. So uh, I say that to say this, you, you set your depth wherever you want. This this line in here on the inside, that was the 80s Les Paul that custom that I restored. Much, much more. Uh, oh, I do have it. Yeah. Much, much more elegant and long and soft and more modern, you know, even very square. We are if you watched any of the Flying V videos, very flat right here and all that stuff. It's it's beautiful and it and it's very fitting. Would it look right on this guitar? Absolutely not. Oh, no, not, not on this one, because this is vintage correct, the one that we're building here. Okay, I got I to gotta reel myself in, even though it's just, I have to keep reminding myself, there's one person out there that has never, ever thought about building a guitar neck on this level, or even worse, has never even built a guitar neck. And I say that, say this, and I'll spend about three seconds with it. If you've never built a guitar neck, this is not the neck you need to be building. You're not qualified. It's going to be way over your head. You need to be building just your uh, flat uh, fender type neck, and I'll leave it at that. So, but if you have done this before, or you're just an exceptional woodwork, then I'm going to hold your hand to the finish line. So, how did I how did I get this really nice uh, template? Uh, I started with a piece of paper. <laughs> okay, started with a piece of paper. And I knew some constants. So let's just let's just leave this intimidating blank sheet of paper up here and ask ourselves, man, where do you, where do you even start? Okay, we were smart enough to buy our wood in S4S. If you don't know what S4S means, you might not be qualified to be building what we're we're building. But S4S means square four sides or surfaced four sides. And if it is surfaced, it's going to be very square and very true. So we know that this surface here is flat and true in relation to that surface. We know that this surface is flat and true in relation to that surface and that surface. So we know we've got an S4S board. So, and we know that this construction paper, this $1.80 paper, whatever it costs, we feel pretty confident that the outside edges are perfectly straight. Well, then we got our first constant right there. And guess what we also have? I'm going to pull this up because I'm going to cheat because I don't trust my memory. Uh, we're, we we got to end up with that right there on the, um, uh, was that in the, it's a little bit dark at the bottom, but I, I, I know if anything, anybody could, could understand where we're going here. So we know that this is going to be going up against that edge, correct? Uh, well, we don't have it. we got to draw it. And all we've got to do, I'm just going to go through the constants. We have a headstock area up there that we know has to be a certain length. 
So don't do, don't do this and end up going, oh crap, I'm not, I don't have enough room for my headstock. If you're this far enough alone, just start somewhere in the middle. If you want to know the truth, I started roughly in the middle and then I cut off what I didn't need. Don't try to engineer a perfect starting point and a perfect this. You'll, you'll, you'll end up screwing something up. Just give yourself a little bit of room on either side and then find this starting point. Okay, this is where we're going to come out of the gate. And that starting point is this point. Um, okay, don't let me confuse you. But I'm going to call this, well, I'll tell you what, I don't want to confuse you. We're, we're going to call this starting point the fret, where, where the fret, we're going to call that the starting point. And that's where, I'm just going to, I'm going to really be elementary here. That's where the fretboard starts. Okay, so that's going to be our, our starting point. We've given ourselves enough room in the length on the construction paper. We're not worried about adding to this. So we, we make that mark. And let's, I'm just going to grab a number out of the air, and I'm going to say that was eight and a half inches from the edge of the paper. Okay, once you got that one little dot, now we're going to measure down 376.05 millimeter and we're going to make another mark. Don't try to do any of this. Um, don't try to do any of that that uh, angle work or that pitch work. Leave it alone. All I want, all I want, are starting points. I'm defining my constants on my piece of paper. And then, if you want to go ahead and measure down roughly, that's fine. But it's quite frankly, it's irrelevant at this point. And then uh, the next thing would be. Okay, if that's my starting point, I'm going to go, I'm going to move forward and, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and help you engineer it more than I promised I would. But let's say you're going to go with a Floyd Rose. Okay, I hope you're not. But if you're going to go with a Floyd Rose, then your, your Floyd Rose uh, nut is much wider. It's almost a half of an inch. Okay, but we're staying traditional here. We're going to be in the uh, in the the three sixteenths of an inch thick arena. Let's see if these are the same. Yeah, this brass Les Paul nut and this tusk nut that was provided by the owner, they are both trustworthy trustworthy to be considered three sixteenths of an inch. Okay, once I have see this was my starting point. Now all I'm doing, I'm just adding, I'm just reaching up and adding that point. I'm not looking for the line, so I'm, I'm going to add that little point, 3 sixteenths of an inch higher than that starting location. All right? I know, I know you should be on the same page with me. And the reason I brought that up is we went on our Tundra Man fretboard calculator, and we, we, we type, we, we punched in, we're doing a 24.562 inch scale, or your scale might be 25 inches, or it may be 25 and a half. What you're looking for is you need to go down and, and, and assess what is the distance from the beginning of the fretboard to the first fret, okay? And whatever that number is, I want you to come down to that point and mine is roughly one and one half inches. And just imagine this is the edge of the paper. I'm going to come down one and one half inches. And then I'm going to go out. Okay, I'm going to go off the edge of the paper. And I'm going to ask myself, how thick of a neck do I want? And I look on here and it tells me that it needs to be uh, 0.885. Well, not the lower. That's the total thickness. So I've got to engineer. Uh, let me see if I can keep from losing here. My fretboard on my guitar is considerably thicker than stock. This is more like a cello, or this is more like a violin. It's an insanely thick fretboard at, at right at about five sixteenths of an inch thick. I would prefer you didn't do that because you won't understand how to treat the binding. So just shoot for your fretboard being. Uh, one quarter of an inch thick. Okay, so if if that if this little template just told me to build this point uh, eight eight five, then it needs to be point eight eight five from that distance there. In other words, it's point eight eight five 
less 0.25, which is a quarter. And then that's my magic number that I come down and make a mark. Is that, is that the mark I'm going to make for my template? Absolutely not. Add a sixteenth of an inch at a minimum. But don't dare add an eighth of an inch. If you have to add an eighth of an inch, well, let me back up. I take that back. Um, I'm a cowboy, and I know I know of my abilities. I, I split hairs, but that's dangerous because if you rough out your neck and then you start getting just a little bit of movement, and I don't mean it's distorting, but if you've got just a little bit of, of twist or something, something's weirds going on, then you didn't leave yourself enough room to make corrections. So I hope you guys can read between the lines and realize uh, I'm talking about working with wood that has acclimated to my shop and I'm about 99% certain that once I rough this out 1 16th over the actual finished neck, I know I'm going to be fine. And if you want to know the truth, my template is really closer to 3 30 seconds of an inch over standard. So on that note, make your mark there, but then add about, uh, if you want to add an eighth of an inch, that's okay. That's a little fat. And then the same thing uh, on our fretboard scale calculator, uh, in case I lost anybody, we've measured down, we found that point from the nut, and then we measure down and we got, we, we're, we're looking for this target location right here. Okay. Now the next thing we want to do is go down to the 11th, the 11th fret, which is that location right there. Repeat and rinse. It's going to be thicker, but not much. Uh, it really should be no more than about one eighth of an inch thicker than um, that first fret location. So if you knew that you played a guitar and you and you and you loved it, everything about it, and you found out that yeah, it's it's uh, really thin, like a seven eighths of an inch thick out there. Well, then that's all you need. To me, that's enough of a constant that I can engineer everything from just knowing that one location, and I can build you a neck that's identical. Is if as long as you just told me that thickness right there. That's all I need. I can build a whole neck because I can engineer everything else. I don't expect you to do that. But what I'm saying is if you have that me measurement down here, that target number, and let's say it's seven eighths of an inch, it's not on this guitar. It's more, this guitar is more like a little bit right at about 15 sixteenths. Just add an eighth of an inch. And what do you have now? You've got a, a point, you got a point right here and a point right here. All you got to do is draw a straight line, okay? And that's what I meant by you start with paper and a straight edge, and you can build a guitar. Now, let me check the time. Yeah, we're at 23 minutes. That's, that's a lot of, it's, a, it's we're pretty far into the, to the, to the uh, video, but I'm just going to keep going because uh, this stuff's important. Even if we don't get to do any rough out in this video, uh, I, I want you guys to realize, take a lot of time doing your designs because if you if you can do it on paper, you'll start seeing, wow, okay, what kind of tools should I use to even cut that? And um, I can cut that with a table saw, believe it or not. I can cut that with a handheld jigsaw and it'd be that damn good. I shouldn't have said that, but it, it, it'll be that, that perfect. Um, I can cut that with a router. I wouldn't recommend that, but that's that's a lot of noise and a lot of dust. But um, uh, and I could cut it with a bandsaw. So as you start draw, as you start drawing things, you'll realize, oh yeah, this is perfect. And if I was just drawing a straight board, if I was just cutting out a straight board, then I know I'd use my table saw. But I I don't want to use the table saw for this because there's compound cut work going on. I'm making a transition from a flat here into a flat here, but I can't do that with a table saw. I can, but it's going to require that I do a ton of work that is unnecessary. So believe it or not, if you told me I only had, had the choice of one tool, I can only use one tool to build a snack, then give me my, give me my DeWalt handheld jigsaw. I can build the jazz guitar. So keep that in the back of your mind. 
Uh, you don't have to have a bandsaw. You don't. You need a table saw for other stuff. But uh, nonetheless, if you've ordered this beautiful straight wood, you can build your guitar with a jigsaw. And it doesn't even have to be a really high quality jigsaw because we're not trying to achieve the finished guitar with our um, jigsaw. We're gonna we're gonna be achieving the finished guitar with sandpaper. And most all of you pro woodworkers out there know that if you you know if you really had to uh, uh, if you wanted to know the truth, uh, the our files and our sanding equipment is the most important tool in the shop. So all right, so I, I'm getting a little bit off off track and and, and uh, uh, mentioning unnecessary items, but. For the, no, maybe not because I'm just trying to clarify. Where if if you can do it on paper, then you'll start seeing how. Yeah, that's what I meant. As you as you're doing it on paper, you'll start seeing ways that you're going to rough it out and ways that you can guarantee certain things. Or also, you're going to make note of things like, well, I can just leave that long because it doesn't matter. I'll cut that once it's on the body. And I'm just saying that don't don't think it to death. You'll drive yourself crazy. For the most part, there's only three or four constants that are critical and it would be from the beginning of the fretboard to that 16th fret location whether it's a 24 and 5 8 inch scale or a 25 and a half inch scale it's a considerable difference between those two scales okay and i'm not going to repeat anything because if anything if i'm getting over your head this is going to be a video that you're going to watch three or four times before you start uh, pulling out the construction paper and what does it cost us on uh, construction papers less than a dollar and we got pencils laying around so all right let me do that i'm going to pause the video and i'm going to think about how to transition into uh once you've got that drawn and and cut out and you're all happy with it how to transition into um the wood Okay, let's finish up this section of the video. And you've gotten your uh, first uh, template drawn, I mean, uh, cut out, and you feel really confident that you engineered everything properly and you thought about uh, the whole build project. And once you get one, let's, let's make another one because we're gonna need two in order to lay it out on the paper. Uh, I mean, lay it out on the uh, board. And I'll, I'll touch on this briefly. Do you, could you just go from paper straight to, to your finish board? Um, this is not me being a, a smart, you know what. Um, one of the first guitar necks I ever built, the, the, I paid $460 for the board. And I can assure you, I did not go from paper to that board with a saw. So according to the material that you're working with, uh, you make that call. But if you've never done this before, don't go straight to your wood. Let's go to some a piece of poplar, like, um, you know, three quarter inch thick, uh, um, one by four, one by six, or just whatever. Go to, pop, go to your poplar, lay this on, on, on the board, and, and draw draw around it and, and start experimenting on, on different ways to cut it out. There's literally three or four different ways. Uh, I've already kind of told you, you know, you, you make that judgment call based on your comfort level and the tools that you even own. If you don't have a jigsaw, uh, let, let, me pause the, let me pause the video. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm gonna spend about 30 seconds with this. You don't have a jigsaw, there's absolutely nothing wrong with working with a coping saw. If you want to know the truth, there's everything right about working with a coping saw because it is amazing what you can do with this little tool right here. If you don't know, you can loosen up the handle and you can take this blade out and you can drill a hole down into a board and then you can run this blade through that hole and then you could do all your sawing. Watch some videos on, on watching guys work with a, a coping saw and they're typically, they're typically cutting like this. It's very much an art form, but, and you're watching that blade and uh, very, very therapeutic too. So don't underestimate the power of a coping saw to make uh, that cut, that transition cut right there. 
You don't want to take a coping saw and cut the whole thing out, especially out of like a bird's eye maple, but maybe you, you run a saw up to that point, like the table saw, and you stop back here, and then you do some coping saw and whatnot, and then you finish, then you relieve that, get rid of that wood, then you run the table saw a little farther, and then you take your coping saw and you run the rest of that out. And I really want to stop talking about that because that's not what this video is about. Most of us out there have you know, band saws, um, jigsaws, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't have to, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with drilling holes in wood and feeding these blades in and, and, or even just starting at the edge of a board and just, you know, and just cutting into that board and cutting it out. So let me put that to the side. Okay. So, uh, let me see. And, and here's the deal. I, I, I'm, I've been really bad about, uh, stopping these videos because I feel like I'm too long winded. Then I do the video again. And by the time I've gotten into the third video, I can't remember what I covered. And I don't want these video series to be, I think I covered that. I think I didn't, I'm just going to run with it. And if I ramble and I, I seem like I have no purpose at all, it's only because I got to do these videos in, in one shot and then get it behind us. So we've got our templates and we're getting ready to go to wood. Okay. So the question is, do we, do we go ahead and, and, and make this template and put this wooden template on here and hear me out. Maybe just go ahead and take our router and just run the router along the top and just cut this whole thing out like a it's kind of like a, our own little handheld CNC machine if you want to you, you can do that there's nothing wrong with that at all I don't uh, because there's no surface here I would have to build up additional support for the router because I don't want to be running a router across a, a platform that's only um, you know, a half of an inch thick or five eighths of an inch thick, and then guarantee that I don't start doing this crap here. So, uh, so do you take, do you go from that paper and make the template and route it out? You can, or do you want to just grab your pencil now and start drawing around this and then take your jigsaw? That's probably the safest if you've never done this before. But I say that to say this, if you're just building a very basic neck out of a piece of maple, you don't necessarily have to do this unless you just want to want to kind of work your way to the finish line. So now this is where it gets really important. You have to start assessing the lumber that is in front of you. And the first thing I saw when I received this board about, I don't know, three or four months back, because it's, it's been in my shop acclimating, uh, you know, well, about three or, three or four months. Did it need it? Nah, I could have worked with it within the first week because of this guy that I bought it from. But I wanted to start assessing end grain, and I wanted to start assessing any uh, any imperfections. And the good thing about this guy is if, if there is an imperfection or something, he'll let you know. It's like, hey, there's a run out here, or there's a knot, or there's a this, or there's a that. But for the most part, I'll see if I can get a tap tone. I can find the node. Now, I should have found the node. I'm not going to waste time with that, but for the most part, this baby's ready to turn into a, this is almost ready to put the strings on it. I mean, it's, this wood's ready. So now all I got to do is, is start assessing what do I want it to look like? And I've already assessed based on the grain, uh, the annular ring orientation and what I want this neck to look like once it's finished. I know that I want to build the neck like this right here. And I hope that's in the video. Let me just put it up here and then I may pause the video. Yeah, I'll probably will pause the video after this and draw some pencil lines. And, uh, but I do want to do a flyby, a bit of a flyby and show you guys, um, what, what I'm seeing when I'm looking at a blank board, I'm already seeing this things right here because I've done it so many times. And that'll just come naturally over time. And you'll start and the one of the first things you might be asking yourself, well, wait a minute, the, the, the tenon is interfering with the headstock. Well then ask yourself which is more important? To cut the headstock in half? No. Or to allow the bottom of that tenon to be 
to receive a little fillet, which will get buried down in the bottom, in the, in the body. Is it, are we going to do that on this hundred mahogany deck? No, of course not. Won't need to. But if I do, it won't matter because it visually, it's never going to be seen. Uh, from a tonal standpoint, I will be, if I had to put a fillet there, it would be epoxied in place. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much fillet work is in the heel of that guitar, and it didn't didn't hurt the tone at all. So I'll do a flyby. Uh, that's going to be my actual layout in preparation for rough out. Okay? And every bit of it is based on the fact, the primary, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and show this, and then I'll pause the video. Every bit of it was based on the fact that there's a little bit of a darkness in this wood. You know, is that an imperfection? No, of course not. It's it's maple. It's just natural. But but for the most part, and I'll go ahead and cover this. For the for the most part, this 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 the, the neck will, will basically be like that right right there. And for the most part, that's going to get cut out anyway because up at the the nut location. Uh, I don't need I don't need all that wood. Every bit of that wood is going to get cut off. So probably every bit of that that discoloration is going to be, disappear. It's going to be gone. It's going to be cut off and removed. There might be a little bit of discoloration, but for the most part, if there is no more than what's on that 1960 Gretsch that my last 6120 Gretsch that I had, I sold for nearly nine thousand dollars. So I can assure you, people don't care about that type of stuff. If anything, they like that. Okay, uh, let me pause, get organized, and then I'm going to move into uh, uh, the rest. Let me just cover something momentarily. Uh, it won't take just a moment to do this. Uh, you may have heard me talk about positive and negative space before in some of my other videos. To me, this would be a, a negative space template where it reveals the material that I will be cutting out. And if this board had a knot right there, and, and maybe that, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, at, I'm creating a what if, but let's say there was a knot right here. But the the knot started right here, but it ex exited the board way down here. You know, so I realized, hmm, okay, maybe, maybe on this one I go ahead and push it down this direct a little not not much because we've got to deal with the others all i'm saying you can use sometimes you can use negative space templates and and start locating or okay let me slow down working working around any any potential issue in a board create your own what if in other words uh you just let that uh, bad area become a drop in the board and or one thing I do like about negative space templates, it allows me to find certain things that are beautiful. Like if this is a bird's eye maple, I might get in, I might, I might start experimenting with, okay, what if I do this versus this versus this versus, you see what I'm saying? You literally, if once you've got your templates and you can see everything because with these positive space templates um they're just as good because you you can you'll you'll know what's up under there but um anyway I'm, I, know, I need to stop talking about that because that's just very basic in general woodwork and i don't want to become condescending but, but i just want to mention that you'll you can work with either positive space templates which i call that positive or you work with negative space templates and it starts revealing very, very quickly, wow, that's the guitar neck, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at just, you know, see how it's thinner up here. It's a little bit thicker right there. And then you see the curvature and you begin to realize, oh, this is going to be beautiful. Or you begin to find problems and you realize, oh man, I'm way too round right here. I need to be more soft. So let me pause and then I'm going to do some uh, pencil work. Okay, let me start up briefly and show you a little bit of what I call trickery. Uh, you can take a, a level and just put that up against your board that is perfectly S4S and you know that you got a nice flat surface. I had to lit, raise it in the back because it's it's not why it's not thick enough to trust, so I had to raise that up in order to get a flat surface. I pushed my paper template up up against it, 
and I put tape across it, not in in an area that is radius, but in a flat area. Even that if I didn't get to put a piece of pencil mark there, but once I pull the template off, well, I can just connect the, the two lines. So I got a piece of tape right there and a piece of tape right there. So let me pause and I'm gonna probably do the same thing on the other side. Then I'll come back, we'll do some pencil work. Okay, let me uh, jump back in the ring here and kind of show you what I've got going on. I moved the little block to the other end to raise the level, which I'm at using as a fence. Then I pulled this uh, second piece of paper template over. And um, uh, then I, I've already drawn the pencil line around that one. So I'm, okay, I know, I'm confident even if I had to, if I wanted to, I could take it off. But I taped this down. In other words, I pulled that template up against the, the fence and I put a piece of tape there, made certain that it was nice and true, that it, that it didn't get any sort of warp, and then put a piece of tape right there. And then basically, you're just going to want to come in, um, bear with me just a second. I have an old vintage uh, pencil sharpener that is, I love using just a number two pencil. And then uh, basically all you're doing, as expected, you're just drawing around it. But it's pretty critical that, uh, that your paper template is very thick paper. And I'm going to work, or I'll tell you what I'm going to do because the last thing you want is a little bit of a twist, like going over that paper, because what I was about to say, that paper is super thick, and it'll really hold its shape. Well, that's exactly right, and the last thing I want to be doing is trying to go over that other piece of paper and keep it straight. Is that in the camera? I'm just barely, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I probably should have it like this. Um, you know, just tracing around it, I mean, if I, if I try to sh show you how to do that, that is straight up condescending because we've done such a good job. Um, making our paper template that this is pretty simple. I want to show you, this is pretty important though. The way I was doing this, I was using this finger to make certain that I pushed along the paper template as I held it up here. Does that make sense? Let's see if I can just lean over. And that, that guarantee, I could close my eyes right now and I can feel the lead go up against that real thick template. And my right, I guess that's called the ring finger, even though it's the right, on the right hand. Yeah, that finger right there. And then I'm always just making certain that the template doesn't move. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really even need that anymore. Let me hang this back. All right, what else? Because, uh, you see, we've got that taped in there, and I'll show it in a moment. I just want to go ahead and uh, uh, make this tracing before I forget. And it's very simple. It's funny, I'm, when you're trying to do things on camera, it's so much more difficult because you're... Uh, Trying to make certain that everybody can see it. And uh, I'm going to show you, I'll just go ahead and mention to you, anytime you see me draw a dashed line, it means it's an, it's an undecided, or in other words, it, I'm assuming that it's correct, but there's a possibility it's wrong. Okay? So, and I'm about to show you, um, that's a dashed line just because I couldn't reach it. That's, that's a constant. And then you're going to, Probably one of the most important things you're going to verify the length, because you'd be surprised once you pull this, once you pull this template off. I think I've already got a, a flyby. Once you pull this template off, let me get these off the table. All right. Once you pull these templates off, if you had forgotten to draw that end line right there, and if your templates weren't very accurate 
In other words, everything about your templates where they were an eighth inch wider than they really needed to be and or a you know a quarter inch longer than they really needed to be. Well, for the most part, then you did you didn't really create a template. You just gave yourself a general idea. But it's not that difficult to connect straight. Well, it's not difficult at all to con- to connect straight lines because I know that mark right there. That's precise. I know that this hill is precise. So when I'm up here with my jigsaw or bandsaw, you better bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be cutting on that side of that pencil line. And I'm going to be cutting on this side of that pencil line. We all know that. We're woodworkers. You know, we, we all know things like that. Uh, I'm going to digress a little bit here. I always uh, make some sort of reference like this is, uh, I'm just going to go A103. It means nothing, but it means everything. When I look when I look in the box over there and I'm thinking about cutting ears to fit on this side, I know for a fact that A103 drop will mount perfectly to A103 and the grain orientation going on here and here will be spot on identical. Any chatoyancy, any bird's eye, anything, any coloring, that's going to be your most likely perfect match if you if you can if you can do that for the most part in this neck I won't be able to do that because that ear is not long that those are called ears that ear will not be long enough doesn't matter uh, because this is not meant to be you know a ten thousand dollar jazz guitar anyway I'm just showing you guys how to how to lay out a board in preparation for your rough out so. Uh, let me pause the video. I'm going to connect the dots and then I'm going to see if there's time to do any sort of rough out. I don't think there's going to be, but we'll see. Okay, I should be able to finish the video in this section. Um, one thing I did do that uh, is really safe. There's nothing wrong with doing things like this because once you, uh, once you, are hovering over this thing either with a handheld jigsaw or your bandsaw and all that stuff, and you're looking down, you're looking down at, at a bunch of lines. It's it's pretty easy to get off. Most of us as woodworkers, we know uh, when we're working, especially with something really critical. If this was a piece of bird's eye maple that was my grandfather's, I'm not. I'm screwing up is not an option. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to make X's uh, where. You know, I need to be cutting, and I'm going to be very precise. And, and you might even look at it and go, oh, everybody knows where. You'd be surprised when, you, when you're when you looking at something that's covered in sawdust and you're pushing it through the bandsaw, it sure is comforting to look up there or blow across there, and you see that X, and it helps you think. Or you do things... Um, you do things like this right here where if you were really splitting hairs and let, let's say you were building a guitar with, with a with a real deep body I've done this I have literally built guitars where I took that heel all the way up I mean within just one more rotation of the blade if I let the blade go any further I'm gonna lose this neck and it's a stained gray it's a clear coat neck that that if the if the angle of the blade is even 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 monitored, I'll lose the neck. So you could do things like come in here and put some tape on here, and you know do a skull and crossbones if you have to, you know do some sort of emergency, and get in your mind like if you have a certain marker color like a I don't know we'll we'll say uh, red obviously because red is is is. Is, is beyond caution so it's hazard maybe hit that with a red marker that way that you'll know that when you when you're sitting here and you're almost hypnotized as you're making this cut here and then you come around this corner and you and you start seeing that red you know whoa wait a minute so this is like a, a a stop sign area in other words you're creating a stop sign a stop point and um so um uh, you know, just proceed with caution, and you can and you can really, really um, lay out the board in preparation for rough out, so that 
you will remember and you'll be able to look at your finished guitar and you'll see the grain <laughs> variation in in this part of the neck and how it's replicated down here in the heel because you'll know just how close you were cutting and splitting hairs. Anyway, I, I didn't mean to talk about that. I didn't want to spend too much time, but I did want to just kind of go off the cuff here and, and talk about the general stuff because I'm not going to pause the video and do any rough out. We're still doing design work, so I need to keep this about design work. And I need to make certain that I think about the things that I might have made a mistake, you know, on, you know, years ago or made, made some sort of mistake decades ago that might help you guys not make that mistake. Uh, oh, yeah. One thing that is pretty important. Uh, where is it? I like the idea of having a master template. Uh, and when I say a master template where you've truly written all your critical notes, don't load it up with BS, but be very thorough and be very thoughtful about what it is that you might need to know or things that are very critical. And where I'm going with this is even when this was up here uh, taped in place, I, I leaned it over on the top side and I transferred that uh, 376.05 millimeter distant to that point right there. And I took my square and I went ahead and I defined that baby because to me, that's an engineered point that I'm working from. And anytime you see a, a, a this is pretty important. So, okay, so, so I transferred that line and then also I transferred the beginning of the fretboard line. Okay, I'm sorry to be so chaotic. Let, let me, this is pretty important. I don't need to, to, to be so reckless. I should have taped the, you know what, thing down. And uh, that way I would have made a fool of myself here. All I'm trying to say is when you're transferring from the paper to the wood, uh, once you take those training wheels off and, and you can't find that template or, or either the template got destroyed, it, was, it, it sure is comforting to know that, whew, Oh, I did draw a straight line and what that straight line represents. That's the beginning of the fretboard. Okay. That's where the fretboard is going to begin. Period. That location is not going to change. Don't let that location change. You see these dashed lines? Get used to making dashed lines that represent. That's roughly where... A certain location should be but if there's a dash line always keep in the back of your mind it may be wrong but if you see a solid straight line and especially in my jobs if you came in my shop and you saw a board like this where it had a straight line and it was in pen that's that's like the, the ten commandments you know that's carved in stone so same thing down here straight solid line that's definitive that's the, and what is that? That's the 16th fret location. That's not going to change because when I rough this out, I'm, if I have to, I'm going to rough this out a little bit big and then I'm going to put it on my uh, oscillating sander and clean that baby up. Okay. So we're, we're, we're doing this in like three or four very thoughtful steps so that it's a extremely enjoyable. You don't want to be so wound up that you that you can't even enjoy what it is that you're doing and I this this will take just a moment but the first three to five jazz guitars that I built it was it was miserable I was I was just miserable because I had been working wood for a long long time before I had ever started building jazz guitars and I was even studying the Robert, Robert Benedetto courses the Robert Benedetto vocational series and it's not like I hadn't had someone, and not only someone, but a master guitar builder. I'm watching his videos, and I'm thinking, I can do that. Man, I've done that a thousand times. And then you go in the shop, and you start trying to do it on a $400 piece of wood. You get so wound up, you, you realize you don't, you're don't, you not even enjoying yourself. So if you, if you do all this stuff on the front end, uh, you really enjoy it. Because you've, you've put so much thought into it that the odds are you're, you're not going to make a mistake. And even little things like that where the pickup cavity is going, the neck pickup cavity is going to be. I went ahead and made some dash lines right there. Why is that a dash line? Because that fretboard may end right here, 
rather than right there. Or in other words, um, all this might move that direction, but this is a very consistent, this is a very, very defined end point. I don't have to be any longer than that. And after I get this neck built, quite frankly, this might get trimmed off another eighth of an inch. And this might get moved a sixteenth of an inch. So, but regardless, I got to end somewhere. And you could also do that same thing where maybe you go uh, A107 and A107 because you might take that little fillet right there and use it to epoxy to the bottom corner to finish out the perfectly square tenon. I hope my arm's not in the way. I'm going to go over that briefly just a little bit one more time. Uh, you might you might write like an A107 here and an A107 here so that when you get ready to uh, um, fill in the blank, <laughs> you'll have the matching species. And a lot of times when I'm doing stuff like this, I'll go ahead and knock that out, even in a rough state, because I don't want to be digging through a box going, oh, sheesh, where's, the, where's that board? Where's this? Next thing you know, I picked up this one right here and put over here. Does that matter in this? No, it does not matter. But you need to train yourself to work in that mindset where you're continually thinking about, you know, what, you know, if, if I'm if I do a certain thing, what might else it cause me to have to address later on? So anyway, um, I think that should be enough on that. I'm gonna very let me check the time. All right, we're still under an hour, so hopefully I can keep this under an hour. I hit this very briefly because uh, it takes forever for these to upload. I had mentioned uh, I like working with the thicker leaves if I'm doing a multi-piece neck, but this is what you can expect. If you order three boards or you get one really large board that is three quarters of an inch thick, nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that at all. Robert Benedetto, a, a, a great bulk of the guitars he was building that I was learning from, um, they were, they were, Three piece necks that were three quarter, three quarter, three quarter. I'm certain that not all of his guitars were that way. But if, if someone like that can build a guitar and it being an incredible jazz guitar, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing I don't like is I have a tendency, if I'm doing a jazz guitar, it's going to be clear coat. It's going to be visible. And that's fine if you want. And, and what I'm saying, I like, I want to do an accent. I want to do those accent lines that I was talking about, you know. And I typically like to do contrasting colors where I'm doing, if I'm doing a maple neck, I want my center line to be, you know, mahogany, uh, pinstripe, cocobola center, or pao ferro, you know, Bolivian rosewood, and then a, a maple pinstripe veneer, you know, the little veneer. And then I, then I go back into my uh, maple and or rosewood neck or, or blah, 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 blah. So I say that, say this. If you are going to do a three-piece neck and you want to do that pinstriping, that is a beautiful neck. It is beautiful, meaning there's a, a three-quarter inch center, defines the center of the neck, and then there's, uh, let's say it was maple, and then you could do like a walnut veneer pinstripe on either side, and then you do the three-quarter inch maple on either side. That's a beautiful neck. But don't come out here, please don't come out here and start doing wide um, accent lines and turn it into a, a, what would some people would consider a, a nine or a, an 11 piece neck. That's crazy and gets very absurd. So it's okay to do things real tasteful, but just be careful about going from one con really bizarre contrast to another. Um, a maple neck with uh, a real thin mahogany veneer within the maple leaf on either side is beautiful, stunning, especially if it's a bird's eye maple with a mahogany veneer. I don't think I've ever done one with walnut because I'm kind of scared. I don't want to look down and see black. I don't want to see it so black that it looks like it might have been done with a magic marker. I want to look at that and realize, oh, I see that's mahogany or that's cocobola. You see what I'm saying? So you could do the three piece neck out of three quarter inch material but here's where I'm going with this. A very long-winded way about getting to the point of why I don't like working with uh, three-quarter inch, three-quarter inch, three-quarter inch. Because if you do that, 
Oh shit, I missed it on the top. I think I missed the whole, you know what thing? I did, unbelievable. Let me pause the video, hold on. Okay, let me quickly finish the video because I didn't realize it was as far as long, as long as it is. Uh, basically, uh, the only thing that I don't like about doing a three-quarter, three-quarter, three-quarter inch neck is by the time you come in and cut off the the excess, your, your treble uh, leaf and your base leaf become so, um, so, so minuscule. Now, I know most guys would be thinking, it doesn't matter because it's glued up and it's all epoxied or it's all one piece now once it's glued. Yeah, I, I get that. That's fine. But keep in mind, keep in mind, we got to come in here in this middle board and we got to run a router down it and, and take even more material out of that neck. And I'm trying to build a neck that if this grain in the middle has a certain strength, and uh, all I'm trying to say, I'm trying to build a strong neck. And if you cut off all this material and you cut off all this material and then you come in here with a round over and you cut, up, cut it basically into a, a round, you've turned it into a quarter of a pie. Uh, there's just not much material left. And then you got a glue join. And in the event that glue join was just a little bit inferior in comparison to the wood you know, molecular structure. I don't mean a failure, but, you know, glue is glue, and a tight bond especially is tight bond. And if you don't get a real firm clamp on tight bond, I don't care what anybody says. You got wood, and then you got a, a rubber gasket, and then you got wood. That rubber gasket might be paper thin, or even beyond paper thin, but nonetheless, I'd rather have a two-piece neck where each each side is massive and then when i run that route down you know down the middle you know I, what is it a quarter inch an eighth inch over here and an eighth inch over there so a quarter inch down the middle and then i'm using a very low very very low profile truss rod uh, see what i'm saying now now i'm leaving a lot of the mass in here that now that would be if i went flush I would be leaving a lot of mass in there. And if I step it in and do a fillet above the top, well, then I'm epoxying everything together. So we'll cover those things in the future when I start building the neck. But I just wanted you guys to see um, kind of why I do the certain things that I do. It's just as easy. It's easier for me to just buy the wood already one inch thick, if not one and one eighth inch thick, if I can get that. And then it's a faster build and more precise. And I'm not having to fool with additional glue lines and stuff like that unless I want to. And if I'm doing glue lines, it's very intentional and they're meant to be uh, uh, accent lines rather than just uh, trying to stretch a board. So I'm going to end the video right there. Uh, the next video will probably be me going, This these will be roughed out. And then once I do rough these out, this is pretty important. If I go ahead and build this neck as a two-piece neck or a three-piece neck, whether it's the mahogany guitar or either my own guitar, once I take that board right there that is nice, big, chunky S4S, and I basically completely cut it in two, now all things will be revealed. If this board is going to be problematic, when I cut it down to roughly five-eighths of an inch thick by an inch wide, if it's going to be problematic, it's going to show up immediately. And if it doesn't show up immediately, it's going to show up within about uh, two to three hours. And then if it doesn't show up in two to three hours, then it's going to show up within a day. And if you rough this out then set it to the side, wait a day or two, keep an eye on it. Keep in mind we're not working out in a backyard shop in the middle of August when it's rainy season. We're working in a controlled environment and we're keeping our moisture content uh, low and or we're working with a board with a low moisture content less than six and a half seven worst case scenario but if it's gonna if it's gonna act up now's the time and i don't care it's not it's not gonna wait until you put it together it's gonna act out it's gonna act up immediately and then you can make the decision hmm well did it dive down and did i leave enough to level this surface again 
In other words, what I'm saying, whatever you see before you, then you'll have to make the decision. Do you use it or do you discard it? And we'll cover the, those things later on. But for the most part, uh, it's a lot of information, but uh, it's very interesting information if you're building a guitar or you just want to have a better understanding of, of what it is that you're holding in your hands and why the guitar that you bought cost five thousand dollars because or seven thousand dollars or you know you you fill in the blank there's there's a lot that goes into it all right thanks guys i appreciate you staying in the ring and until the next video i will uh prepare and see you then thanks